Hi. All right. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. My name is Rene Rocha. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Political Science and also an affiliate of the Public Policy Center uh, here at the university. Uh, the PPC is happy to host this Wonk Wednesday. Uh, they've had um, a variety of different themes. Uh, they have one coming up um, in on November 15th on the Affordable Care Act. Um, that I'll talk a little bit more about at the end, but this one is about immigration uh, policy, you know, in the United States right now, which is obviously something which is rapidly changing and changing in a way which um, is dramatically affecting the lives of individuals in border communities. Also, like as we know, um, in the interior in states like Iowa and uh, other places within the Midwest. And so we have a panel here, including myself and three other uh, individuals, and we're going to give sort of a, uh, I think, a pretty good holistic portrayal of the issue. I'm going to talk a little bit from the side of a policy analyst, talk to you about some data, some trends in immigration enforcement over the past couple of years, explain how those trends really don't fit some of the narratives that have come out, and how I see some of those trends changing over the first year of the Trump administration. And then we have uh, Dan Vondra, who's a lawyer uh, with Colin Vondra, and he'll go talk to us a little bit more about the legal aspects, changes uh, in immigration law, and how, uh, you know, obviously DACA being one of the more prominent examples of a program which is in flux, and we can see how um, uh, the past couple of months have really, really um, changed uh, that part of immigration policy. And then we have uh, Nicole Novak and Jorge Guerra, and uh, they're going to talk to us about some of their own uh, work and give us a little bit more feel for um, uh, work uh, and efforts that are going on within the community, sort of on the ground level stuff. And between those, those three different perspectives, I think we'll get a pretty good sense of what's happening nationally and uh, here within the community. Uh, so we we'll each are going to talk for about eight to ten minutes, uh, give our perspectives, and then we'll open it up for Q&A, and we'll just, you know, we'll see if you guys have questions either about what we're talking or about things that are sort of unrelated to, to issues that we've brought up but that you're interested in, and we'll do our best to sort of field it and have discussion, okay? Uh, so I'm, I'll start us off, and um, what I'm going to talk about... Uh, again, are some, you know, different trends in immigration enforcement over the past couple of years. So what you have here right now is something which I think is relatively underappreciated. Uh, that is the number of forced removals that have occurred annually since the start of the George W. Bush administration. And an important thing to note there is that, you know, a narrative which comes out of the 2012 election, certainly the 2016 election, is this idea of the Obama administration being relatively weak on immigration enforcement. This narrative doesn't quite fit with um, criticism that has come out of some immigrant activist communities, which have done things like label former President Obama the deporter in chief, right? And which one of those two images appears to be more correct? Right. Well, it's true that uh, former President Obama did uh, institute DAPA and DACA, Deferred Action Programs for Childhood Arrivals, or for the parents of, um, of childhood arrivals. However, you can see there that the actual raw level of enforcement was really high under the Obama administration. Right. In fact, higher than under the majority of the Bush administration. Now, that data ends in 2015. If I, I was looking at the 2016 data, it shows a dip, but it's a dip that never drops below where we were at the end of the Bush administration. And so we have to understand that at the moment in time in which President Trump takes office, we already are at a place of unprecedentedly high levels of immigration enforcement. And so when he talks about increasing levels of enforcement, putting more resources into the border, um, putting more resources into the Department of Homeland Security or Immigration and Customs Enforcement, where he's talking about increasing in level of, um, of enforcement that's already uh, at, in a historically unprecedented high. Right? So as I think that's one thing that's really underappreciated. Other thing to think about, uh, rapid changes in um, immigration enforcement during the Obama administration. 
So uh, at the start of the Obama administration, you can see that immigration enforcement is really dominated by Border Patrol. Remember that immigration enforcement is done by two different agencies. There's ICE and there's Border Patrol. Right? Those are distinct agencies. And um, you know, those are distinct agencies. And Border Patrol obviously is dealing primarily with apprehending people who are entering into the United States, removing or returning them back to their countries of origin. Immigration and Customs Enforcement operates somewhat along the border, but also within the interior. And um, for the, you know, in 2005, 2006, 2007, you can see that the majority of efforts by the Department of Homeland Security are really focused uh, on apprehending people at the border. That shifts very suddenly in 2008, right, at the start of the Obama administration, or at the end of the Bush administration, the beginning of the Obama administration. Uh, and we see that immigration enforcement within the interior really increases, right, and that sort of comp, and so border enforcement is in decline, but when we talk about border enforcement being in decline, that piece of information is often not coupled with the reality that interior enforcement is increasing. Right, and um, the full picture of what's happening right, needs to account for both of those things. And the reason why Border Patrol is apprehending less people isn't necessarily because we're spending less money, there's less resources, it's because there are um, significant drops in crossing rates and the number of people who are entering into the United States uh, without authorization. But as the number of people entering declines, then the uh, Department of Homeland Security has shifted its efforts in, into the interior, okay? Um, now, that means that immigration enforcement becomes much more present in places like Iowa, right, where it, uh, back in 2005, 2006, uh, was less so. The other thing that's happening in 2008 is the beginning of a program called Secure Communities, which many people in this room might be familiar with. Secure Communities is a program which uses biometric data to identify possible unauthorized immigrants who enter um, the either uh, the federal, state, or local um, prison or jail system. Right, so anyone who's booked into a jailing facility gets fingerprinted. ICE has a database of, bio, of biometric data of people who uh, have entered into the United States without authorization at some point. They see whether or not there's a match. They identify that an individual is indeed a match, and then they go into the jails and they can apprehend these people. They can take them away from Johnson County, although they can't actually take them away from Johnson County because Johnson County uh, refuses to cooperate with the program. But um, uh, many counties within the United States, and then they can bring them into the custody of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, that program is really responsible for the ability of ICE to enforce in much higher rates. Uh, and that's why the Obama administration was able to dramatically increase the level of enforcement relative to the Bush administration. Uh, in some ways, the Obama administration built this apparatus, and then um, used it, you know, the depart and the Obama administration, you know, did try to sort of in some ways tame or confine uh, the extent to which DHS used that data or to uh, increase the number of removals. Uh, but the unfortunate thing is after building that apparatus, they then handed over to the Trump administration. And now the Trump administration has this infrastructure built during the Obama administration, which allows them to remove individuals with extreme efficiency. Interestingly, what we've seen during the uh, early part of the Trump administration is they've actually been a little bit hesitant to go full gas with this system. And what we've seen is the uh, Trump administration going back to the system which was more popular during the Bush era, which is a more of a raid-based system or a roundup-based system. Right, so if you think about what Secure Communities is doing, right, you're going into different jailing facilities. You're getting one or two or three people at a time. During the Bush administration, the norm was high profile raids. We know about some of them here, Postville, Marshalltown. Now in some ways those are extremely inefficient activities, right? You, the amount of resources you do to apprehend 300 people, right, uh, is cost ineffective relative to waiting for these individuals to just show up in Johnson County, uh, show up in the Johnson County Jail and go in and apprehend them. Right, waiting for the individuals to come to you instead of you doing the investigative work to go and apprehend the individuals. However, Marshalltown is a better headline. 
Postville is a better headline that makes it look like more work than the sort of invisible efforts that were underway during secure communities. And so the Trump administration, going back to the Bush era roundup and raid approach, has actually um, not been able to increase removals to the extent that they probably could if they went with the sort of less attention grabbing but much more efficient uh, method of enforcement during the Obama administration, right? Which is a, you know sort of a little bit ironic, I think. Um, other things to sort of point out, um, you know, before before I go, is. Um, who is actually being apprehended? This is one of the underappreciated uh, parts of uh, immigration enforcement. Um, this is 2014. You know, just the distribution of all people who were who were moved by ICE by criminal offense. The plurality category, none. Right? Uh, how can they be none? They're illegal immigrants. They're illegal, right? By definition. Uh, they're guilty of something. You know, being in the United States without uh, authorization is not a criminal offense. It's a civil violation, right? So, they're, uh, so they are actually non-criminals. The most popular category of, of, uh, of a criminal violation is, an, immigra is immigration, an immigration violation. You know, what are they guilty of? If being in the country without authorization is a criminal violation, entering the country without authorization is a criminal violation, so they're guilty of illegal entry. They're people who have been deported and re-entered. That's a criminal violation, right? So they're guilty of re-entry. Um, you know, visa over, um, and so, you know, various other, you know, types of, um, of violations of immigration law, but, you know, nonviolent, right? Minor crimes, traffic violations. Um, my favorite is, um, the, the Department of Homeland Security codes every crime that an individual is guilty of. You know, in 2014, they deported seven people for fishing in marine sanctuary areas, right? So, you know, lots of various random things, but minor things. Drug crimes, violent crimes, property crimes. There's where we talk about, um, you know, uh, more serious offenses. And you can see there that they represent not a trivial number of removals, but certainly not the majority. Nowhere near a plurality. Right, and um, you know when we talk about uh, when you, we, the, the language that the Trump administration uses, you know, murderers, rapists, drug dealers, gang members. It's such a small percentage of who we're currently enforcing, right? And um, you know, the, at one point, President Trump said he was going to remove two to three million drug dealers and gang members, and you can see there that. They, you know, there's about, oh, you know, 25 or 30,000 in 2014 people of drug violations that got removed. That's not drug dealers, right, because that includes possession of not just um, sale and trafficking. Uh, and you can see there that to get to 3 million when, on average, um, the Department of Homeland Security has been able to apprehend 25, 30,000 you know, sort of grossly unrealistic numbers piddled by the administration. So that's just some data I wanted to share to kind of get a feel for it. Um, but I'll hand it over next to, to Dan to talk to us more about the legal side. Thank you. Um, and from my perspective, what I'm noticing right now, and I think it really goes into the national debate, is how, how does this policy interact with what's going on in the country? And in, in my opinion, um, this, the racial divide, the discrimination, the white supremacy, all this stuff is playing itself out in the immigration offices and in ICE and on our streets. It's always been an issue. Uh, I've got a lot of good stories. In Cedar Rapids, for instance, this was while Obama was president, uh, and a lot of it comes down to local law enforcement and local ICE. How do they treat people and who do they go after? I had a Mexican gentleman and his girlfriend who was a uh, white woman in a park at 1010, park closed at 10 p.m., and guess who they arrested for being in the park 10 minutes too late? Guess who they didn't arrest? Guess who they didn't even cite? Guess who was put in removal proceedings, had to pay a huge bond? So uh, it, it's been going on for a long time, but now it's even more magnified, and it's getting worse. Now I think the trend that we're going to see is it's harder to get citizenship. I've had several clients where you go in for your citizenship interview 
and they ask you the questions, they want to approve it, they're bureaucrats, they want to get you done. We're seeing more requests for evidence. Well, if you can't get your citizenship, if you can't follow these little requirements they give you, you give up, then you can't vote, then you can't um, you know, essentially change the government, you can't petition for your family. It's a lot harder in, in that sense too. So I, I think it's, it's a real scary time in our country uh, and this immigration system is part of that. Uh, you know, the joke on that is it's almost like a foreign government wanted to divide our country and bring all these things to the surface and make our country fail. Uh, it's, really, it's, it's really out there. Some of the stuff that we're seeing um, with ICE, the enforcement, now it's all on detention. They want to put people in jail and lock them up because that's how people give up. If you're put in jail and you're not a criminal, how long, are you gonna, how long are you willing to sit in jail and wait for a bond? Uh, I just had a case that was on the news the other night. Woman flees domestic violence from Guatemala, is paroled in at the border because she's, she's, she comes to the border and says, hey, Border Patrol, I need help. I'm fleeing a domestic violence relationship. She's paroled in, given permission to go to court, shows up in Cedar Rapids four times, and on the fifth, fifth time she's detained. Why? With no bond. What's the point there? She was allowed in legally. Uh, the point is they're going to make it harder and harder to apply for asylum. Attorney General Sessions talked to the immigration courts. And you know, my joke on this too is, hey, he wasn't afraid to lie to Congress, and he told a bunch of lies to the immigration courts. He said that asylum is abused, it's rampant with fraud, um, it's too easy to win asylum cases, and he's telling this to immigration judges. Some of the immigration judges deny 95% or more of their immigration cases that are asylum-based. Uh, so the best grant rates are probably around 60 to 70%. So the stuff that is coming out that is really fake news, I mean, the fake news is really coming right down the pipeline from the administration at the highest levels all over the place. So my biggest concern, frankly, are, are the citizenship, the people who are being turned away and forced to give up. Uh, at that point, I mean, that is really critical to democracy is that the people who are living and working here have to be able to get citizenship in some, in some way. Otherwise, we have this permanent underclass, uh, non-citizen group that's not loyal to our country for any reason, which should also give us concern. If we've got millions of people in this country, that don't have loyalty, again, it does kind of go back to the foreign entity trying to stir things up here and, and really mess with our country and weaken our position in the world. So I think those are kind of my main points is I do think it's all tied. The immigration policy, I used to think, oh, you know, immigration, it's kind of like the new, the, you know, the trendy civil rights movement. Now we've gone so far back that the actual old school civil rights movement is now our current movement again plus immigration, and it's all wrapped up into immigration, and all these uh, overtones and undertones, it's, it's all part and parcel of what this administration is trying to do. And who gets caught up the most? Again, it's the most vulnerable people. Um, right now, juveniles, if a juvenile is fleeing violence in Central America, it's a, it's a huge problem. If they get to the border and have a relative in Iowa, most of them can get status here legally. That's an important point to remember with the DACA. Um, expiration. So if people in Iowa City or if you know people in the university committee who are st or community who are still under 21, they might be eligible for something called special immigrant juvenile status as well. So that's one thing to remember with, with the um, kind of the lapse of DACA is the special immigrant juvenile is something that's available for a lot of kids who are either abused or neglected or just didn't have protection back in Central America. And they can do that in Iowa until they're 21 years old. And again, that's another program that I think uh, Attorney General Sessions and ICE really don't like. But these things they don't like, it's really bizarre from a humanitarian perspective. So, you know, so the uh, special immigrant juvenile status comes from a George W. Bush era law. And, you know, what do you mean you don't like a case that gives status to a child who has been abandoned, abused, or neglected by a parent? Why shouldn't that person be given refuge in this country? We've got space. I mean, we look around in Iowa. There's plenty of space. Has anybody been to Nebraska? There's plenty of space there, too. <laughs> Not that I want to wish make anybody go to Nebraska, but hey, it's better than uh, Tegucigalpa on a lot of days. <laughs> so, you know, that's the weird part of this all, is when you get right down to it, 
the resistance on the part of the administration, uh, I really can't explain it other than, you know, this thing we don't want chain migration. It really does tie back into the whole racial and white supremacist agenda that the administration has really embraced. Um, so that's my perspective from kind of both a law and policy uh, end, of, end of what I'm seeing. And then I'll turn it over to Nicole now, and then, you know, at the end, any questions on the actual laws and things, I'll be happy to talk more about that, too. And uh, I'll just um, introduce Nicole here, point out that she has a PhD in epidemiology. She's a postdoc right now at the uh, U UI College of uh, Public Health, where she's done work on the health consequences of immigration enforcement and also worked with the UI Center for, or, uh, or with the, um, sorry, the Center for Worker Justice. Yeah. Um, good evening, everybody. It's great to see people interested in this topic, and I hope you, you know, go out and tell other people in your community about what you learned tonight. Um, so I'm here tonight on behalf of the Eastern Iowa Community Bond Project, which is a really new nonprofit um, in Eastern Iowa. It was just formalized this spring, um, and I'm here tonight on behalf of Natalia Spina, who is the executive director. So um, the Bond Project uh, was founded by three local residents who have worked with individuals uh, under threat of deportation and the families of those individuals. So Natalia Spina, Julia Zelensky, and Elizabeth Rook. And the mission of the Eastern Iowa Community Bond Project is to bond individuals out of immigration detention and connect them with an attorney to give them be the best chance possible at being granted relief from deportation. So I'm glad that you mentioned Dan um, Bond a couple times because that ends up being kind of a, a critical piece in the process for people who are um, in immigration detention. So um, just a review for people who are not so familiar with this, there's a few ways you might end up in immigration detention, including the secure communities or priority enforcement program where you, you might have come into contact with law enforcement through some other, for some other reason. Sometimes it's just a traffic violation and then you end up being kind of handed over to Immigration and Customs Enforcement or sometimes they have a warrant for someone and they go and they, they find them where they are. But then you're brought to this detention center um, and for a lot of people they end up having to stay there even if there is the option of posting bond. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. So first of all, um, the bond is often financially prohibitive for a lot of people, um, $3,000 to $7,000, sometimes up to $10,000. You might have heard of more, too. I don't know. I, right now, they'll no bond anybody that has a pending criminal case. Uh, most people will get no bonded right now. I would say right now, from the initial bond determination, I haven't seen one under $10,000 for quite a while. Okay. And, and then they can review that with the immigration judge, and the judge will do what uh, he or she thinks is fair. Yeah, so it's regardless a lot for working families to be able to put this money forward, even though the way the bond system works is that once your case is closed, the money comes back to you. So it's, it's not really a question of you having this money to just lose forever. It's just, are you someone who has enough money in the bank to part with it for the sometimes a couple years while your case proceeds. So what ends up happening, the other, the other piece of the bond system is that you need to go and actually bring the bond to the detention or to Omaha in person and it needs to be delivered by someone who has a visa or citizenship legal status in the US. So often because we're often in networks with people with similar immigration statuses as us, sometimes people just don't have the someone in their community to help them post their bond. Um, and so what we end up s s seeing is that there's a sort of system where just because of lack of fluid cash at that moment, people end up having to be stuck in detention. Detention centers are often very far away from people's families. Um, and uh, if you're in the detention center, you're much less likely to actually find an attorney. So that's another thing to know is that while everyone's entitled to an attorney for criminal cases, if I understand correctly, that is not the case for immigration cases. Um, and so we end up this, with this situation where if someone, just by the fact of not having the bond to post and not having someone to post it with them, they can be stuck there for longer and be less likely to get legal representation. And the stats that our group has is that of people who, who don't post bond and don't get an attorney and just stay in detention until their proceedings, 3% uh, of them are eventually granted relief from deportation, whereas people who who post bond and do get a, an attorney, 74% are ultimately granted relief from deportation. So this is sort of a key cog um, in, in the system. Um, another thing is just when someone is stuck in detention, they're away from their family, they lose their job. Sometimes even you know one night away from your work, you can lose it, especially if you're working in a low-wage job where there's very little 
uh, accommodations for folks. And then also there's just the kind of devastation in terms of lack of so social support for, for both the person who's detained and for the families. Um, so I have a, a good friend in Michigan who, who worked with several families who um, had, had family members detained. And they talked a lot about just the kind of guilt and feeling um, like you're not able to provide for your family member, just feeling that, that separation, not to mention all the financial stress, because often the person detained is the primary breadwinner. So if, if the mother is the one who isn't detained, she often has to pick up a job, find childcare. A lot of things start to kind of change uh, through that ripple effect. And it can even affect family abroad, because often people who are working here in the US are sending uh, remittances to family elsewhere. So there's, these, these are really devastating consequences. Um, and so I just thought I'd share a little bit about um, why I wanted to get involved with this, because um, my training is in public health and epidemiology, but I think a lot about um, the way our health is shaped by our social environment and by our community. Um, and so these sort of ripple effects through communities when someone's detained, actually, I think of them as something that would affect people's health. So there's actually a lot of evidence already that places that do cooperate with secure communities, you'll see that immigrant families, and sometimes even mixed status families where some people are citizens, they have higher risk of food insecurity than people who are in the same situation but in a in a a county like Johnson County that doesn't cooperate. So um, people are less likely to access some of the social services that they're, they're entitled to access just because it's scary. It's access, going into public space is intimidating. So these, these, um, these punitive enforcement policies end up kind of rippling out through communities. Um, the way that I looked at that in my work was actually looking at what happened in Iowa after Postville. So that was a raid in 2008 that many of you might have heard of. At the time, it was the largest single site immigration enforcement event in US history. There's been a couple larger since. Um, but we thought of that, you know, because it was so big, you could actually measure some of the effects of it and its ripple effects throughout the state. So we got access to data on births in Iowa, not like with names or anything, but it, it said the person, the mother's race, ethnicity, and whether she was born in the US or not. And actually saw that in the period of time after the Postville raid, all throughout Iowa, so not just in Postville, but all throughout Iowa, there was a higher risk of low birth weight, a higher risk of moderate preterm birth, and actually kind of a shift in the distribution of birth weight, all of which are really consistent with like a stress pathway. So that's not just like your husband was detained or your brother. It's like there's, you know, and there were, this is consistent with what we see. Like if you look at La Prensa, which is a, a Spanish language newspaper on the western side of the state, there were reports in Denison, which is another town that probably saw a lot of commonalities with Postville. They have a meat packing plant. People there are saying, you know, there's rumors about an ICE agent being there. People People are afraid there's a follow-up raid. Someone even published an editorial called No Somos Animales, like we are not animals. So they saw what happened in Postville and all the way over on the side of the state in Denison are saying this is not, this is not, this is about us too. So anyhow, I, that made me think a lot about the ripple effects of immigration enforcement. And I was excited about the Eastern Iowa Community Bond Project, which has, is raising money right now to help people post bond who can't afford it. Um, and actually there's two Cases. We're raising money right now for two people who are currently detained um, and need bond to get out and be with their families. And you know, as a public health person, I think of, we, we talk about like various levels of preventing ill consequences for people. So if there's something that's a threat to health and well-being, you can do primary prevention, which would be just eliminating the, the, the threat altogether. So in that case, this would be like reforming immigration enforcement altogether. Secondary, enforce, uh, secondary prevention is like, for, uh, in, with disease, it's like uh, slowing the progression of a disease. And then tertiary uh, prevention is like mitigating the really bad consequences of a disease. So in that case, I think that what the Eastern Iowa Community Bond Project does is, you know, we've got a lot of problems, but once someone is detained, there's a lot we can do to mitigate those effects. So get the person back with their family, help them have a higher chance of getting uh, a, a um, an attorney, help them keep working, keep supporting their family wherever else they are. And even if their case ultimately isn't successful, at least they have time together as a family. That really means a lot from the cases I'm familiar with, to, to just be together as you actually prepare for what could be a really you know, major event in your family's history. So that's uh, why I got interested in this as um, someone in 
public health. And I think it's a really cool way also that communities can show that they care for people, can support people, um, and maybe just help people feel like people have their back. So uh, our website is communitybondproject.org. Um, and if you know people who might like to donate, please help spread the word. Um, what the last thing to say is the, when the person finishes their case, the money comes back into the bond project. So if you make a donation, you can support multiple immigrant cases over time. That's it. That's fascinating. Thank you, Nicole. Um, we also have Jorge Guerra, who is um, a, a graduate of the UI Writers Workshop, teaches at the Center for Undergraduate Writing, but also does teaches a lot of our courses in Latino um, studies here at the university. Thank yeah. you. Um, hello. Can everyone hear me? Yes? OK, sweet. Um, before I go on and sort of start talking about sort of like my point of view of things, I'm wondering, Nicole, are you, did you participate in writing that article about the birth weights after Postville? Yeah, that is OK, mine. just by coincidence, <laughs> for my students who are here for Intro to Latino Studies, we're going to read that at the end of the semester. Oh, so really? yeah, because I was introduced to it. Good. And then I read it and fell in love with it. I'm like, we're going to use this for Postville and talking about it. So yeah. we plan to use it. I just want to give <laughs> some I was like, is that her? <laughs> so I was like fan grown in here right in this corner. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, I, I'm an instructor here at the University of Iowa, and I'm coming to the approach of, um, I guess you can say, Central American perspective mm -hmm. of this conversation of immigration. Um, I am born and raised in Los Angeles, California. Um, my, both my, my mother and my biological father are from Guatemala. Um, my mother left in the early 80s, and my father left in the mid 80s, he always, he, <laughs> probably should have been sharing this, but I will. Um, he always says, he says that he left in 1983, but he always says, tell people I left in 1982 or 1984 because I don't want um, the Spanish um, government who was trying to go through all those proceedings of human rights abuses in Guatemala to find me. I was like, okay, fair enough. <laughs> and I mean, the reason why he says that because he was one of the many children who were, um, pushed into the army and participating in the atrocities happening in Guatemala during the 1980s. Um, and the reason why I bring sort of like these two figures in my life, um, not only because they, they brought me into this world, but also because their stories and everyone else in the Guatemalan community is essentially um, a, a product of you know U.S. involvement and a country like Guatemala. Um, for my current and former students, we've talked extensively about that in my class, and I still share such stories um, because it, it, at least for me, because you know, I also write. So in order for me to understand the plight of my family members and the plight of my the community members, even when I came here to Iowa and learn that there were so many Guatemalans here, I always need to know why Why are you here? And especially when I came to Iowa, why are, Gu why are there so many Guatemalans here? It makes no sense. Um, I'll, you know, when I first, you know, interesting enough, and I don't think Iowa City does this anymore, um, but around, I moved here in 2012, and around probably like second week of August, there was a sand in, a, sand in the city festival going on here. And there was a woman there who was selling, um, um, a lot of wonderful, beautiful attire that I recognized that was from Guatemala. Mm -hmm. Like I knew real quick, and she's like, okay, she, she, is, she is Guatemalan. And I approached her and then, you know, um, I told her that my family's from there. We communicated, we talked and everything. And then every now and then I would just see her around town and all of a sudden she sort of disappeared from me, even though she gave me her phone number. But afterwards she disconnected um, her phone number and for a long time, I had always wondered, like, where did she go? I would like to talk to her. And then as I sort of, like, walked around here in Iowa City, I kept bumping into other Guatemalans. And I'll never forget the one right at the front of the Pentecris. Um, he was, like, exhausted and tired. And he came up to me, and then he's, like, he talked to me. He said in Spanish, so like, are you Latino? And I says, yes, I am. And he says, can I please get a hug? I'm tired, and I need someone to hug me. And I was like, yeah, I'm more happy to hug you. And then I asked him, where are you from? He's like, from Guatemala. Oh, let's get another hug out of this, because <laughs> we're all family in here. And then he told me about you know, just the struggles of just trying to maintain any type of sanity in Iowa City because of, of you know, not only because of, well, because of course it's Iowa City, we're in a very much white space. And for him, it's he doesn't know how to handle it because his entire income is focused on here. 
And, you know, I tried to talk to him and stuff, and then we sort of went our separate ways. And then when I saw him again, I just dropped this woman's name who I knew at the very beginning. And I, he says, yeah, I know her. And then it says, oh, how do you know her? And then the, he said that we both left Postville because of the rates. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, interesting. I don't know what you're talking about. Please tell me more. And he was like, no, I'd rather not talk about it right now. And then, of course, I didn't want to push it because I've done enough training not to push anyone of their trauma. And when I went home, started looking up, I was like, oh, OK. I can see why he didn't want to talk to me about it. And, and at least for me, I've, I've, again, trying to understand the placement of Guatemalans in somewhere like Iowa, mm -hmm. Los Angeles, always wonder, like, why has, why why has there been all of these movements of, in, during the Guatemalan diaspora? And at least for me, I'm packing that research and trying to understand all the way from the dictator of Guatemala in the earliest 20th century inviting the United Fruit Company mm -hmm. into the country, fast forward to the drug cartels and the consumership of, mm -hmm. of I guess you can say, of United States um, clients who will like to consume all the wonderful drugs that the wonderful drug cartels are essentially providing in areas like Mexico and Central America and North of South America, to me, for, on a large extent, started to make sense. And on a, I guess you can say on a humanist, humanistic level or on a moralistic level, you know, trying to unpack all of the history of, you know, United States, um, the history books called um, 1954 in Guatemala coup d'etat. I'm going to call it what it is. It, it was it was an invasion. The United mm -hmm. States invaded Guatemala in 1954, removing the democratically elected um, president Jacobo uh, Arbenz Guzman. Interestingly enough, um, I'm still trying to find legitimate proof of this. Um, but my wonderful great aunt in Guatemala, who happens to be one of 20 plus kids <laughs> um, from my great grandfather, he fought along the side of the United States. And with Carlos Castillo Armas, who turned out to be essentially the United States puppet who was installed during the 1954 invasion. Um, so learning about that and then learning about how the United States eventually came in and was responsible for the civil war that spanned for 40 plus, I mean, close to 40 years until the peace accords of 1996. And then right in between, knowing about Operation Cleanup, um, the CIA, um, initiating, essentially kidnapping leftists and, and union leaders, kidnapping them, torturing them, wrapping up in body bags, putting them in helicopters, going to the Pacific Ocean and dropping them on the ocean. And then going forward to the 1970s of kidnapping, the disappearance of Guatemalans, seeing from the 1980s, where the Ronald, Ronald Reagan administration essentially um, approved genocide in the country and eliminated all the indigenous peoples in all of the communities, specifically in Western Guatemala and, and in the areas of Guatemala City as well, until when it came to the interest of the United States to stop being on the side of all of these dictators and military rulers in the 1990s and being part of the process of the 1996 accords and then essentially giving, essentially let off air, all, all of the military, military leaders off for all the atrocities they had committed, at least on my end, I always think to myself, especially as a child of Guatemalan immigrants, it's like, what am I supposed to do of a country that I was born and raised in, where I have citizenship in, where I can essentially travel all around the world, but when I go back to visit my family and visit essentially you know, the, the tragedy that happened in that country because of US policy, what am I supposed to do? And at least when I tell my students when we talk about these issues, I, we have to sort of think about it on a moralistic sense and ask like, what should the United States do when essentially all of the, all of the and in the case of Guatemala, when all the Guatemalans leave, what is their responsibility in taking care of them when they're all are racing through Mexico and then coming on the border of the U.S.-Mexican border and they're asking for help? Personally, for me, I, I find it to be absolutely reprehensible when I hear these stories about mm -hmm. deporting Guatemalans, deporting Central Americans, mm -hmm. deporting anyone from also South America and Mexico mm -hmm. and the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Um, the United States has been heavily involved in all of these, of all of these immigration movements up north and elsewhere too, and and in many ways, I, I wish these leaders who who are responsible 
for not only enacting um, deportation, enacting all of these rule, all of these laws and policies that are essentially against all these peoples who are victims of U.S. policies, U.S. foreign policies, to say, and and at least for me. Um, I, I teach here, so the best thing I feel like I can do outside of you know community work when I get involved in any volunteering, anytime I talk to anyone who needs help about these issues, such as the Eastern Iowa Community Prom Project, I I try the best thing I can do is to provide as much historical information as possible to students to understand what in, in the case of me, it's like why are Guatemalans here in the United States? Why are they in Iowa? Why are, are they starting to move to um, Providence, Rhode Island, where there's mm -hmm. teeming in numbers there, and I still find it so fascinating. Um, I think it's very important to look at the historical trajectory of these movements, the historical trajectory of the history of Guatemala in relation to the United States to understand that it's no coincidence that, that my people are here, that me and the Guatemalans are here. It's no coincidence that all these Central Americans are here as well. There's no coincidence that all the survivors of Operation Condor are here. Um, all the policies with the United States with Mexico, it's no coincidence. And it's always very unfortunate that, you know, we hear all of this, I like to call it propaganda because that's what it is, all the propaganda coming out of not only the administration, but anyone who essentially submits to that propaganda as well. Um, I don't like making any historical sort of um, comparisons to what's going on now and to other sort of initiatives where propaganda was used as a tool to dehumanize and eliminate and discriminate. But it's, it's, it's a very haunting time for, for anyone who feels vulnerable under this administration. And at least for me, it's, it's for, because at least for me for a long time, I identified myself as a Democrat and I think, well, a large part of it was because I was in California, the Democratic Party is very different. But then when I came to Iowa, I said, wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> and then learning about these policies that, um, that the Obama administration has pushed forth. Um, and then learning what a wonderful, happy party it is in terms of its, in terms of, in terms of its um, corporation leanings, even though it likes to be in denial about it. There has been a lot for me in Iowa, doing the research that I do, unpacking more history, teaching to my students all the time about these issues. It has completely convoluted my, my political leanings on many issues. It has complicated my mindset and how we're supposed to move forth. And I will forever be angry with my mother when the, single, the Central, Central American immigration crisis happened and 2015, I'm um, hopefully, or 2015 or 2014, I forget the year right now, um, when all of these unaccompanied minors were all on the US-Mexican border. And I was, of course, alarmed, not surprised, but alarmed that these kids have made it this far up north because if you don't know the, the US-Mexican immigration laws and policies against Central Americans, it's a miracle that those kids made it that far up north. Mm -hmm. um, if you just want an example, and I'm glad that some of my students are here, Reading Enrique's Journey mm -hmm. by Sonia Nazario. If you have not read that book, I totally recommend it. She gives you a pretty stark image of why it's a miracle those kids made it that far up north. And I guess to close with my mother, when we were watching this on the news, watch, both in English language media and Spanish language media, I. I, I, you know, I contacted her and says, hi, mom, how are you doing and everything? And then I asked her, how do you feel about seeing all those kids running up there, being put in these detention centers, mistreated, they're lucky enough to go back to their parents, like, what are you feeling, mom? You left the, the 80s for your reasons, and now you see essentially, set, you know, the next generation or the second generation after us. These are post-Civil, post-Guatemalan Civil War kids mm -hmm. coming to the United States. How do you feel? And then she says, what do you expect me to feel? It's a horrible tragedy. It's no surprise 
the best thing we can do is to use the words of my mom is like, hay que darle a luz a Dios. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the best thing that you can do. And of course, she then went on a rant against Obama, but that's a different story. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's sort of my two cents. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thanks. Um, well, I think it's a lot of really great perspectives. Um, so why don't we open up the Q&A now? And um, Leslie has a mic, and she'll go around and... Um... Um, my question is for Dan. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the special immigrant juvenile status and what happens to the kids after they turn 21? <laughs> Well, after they've turned 21, uh, they should hopefully have their green card by then. It, so basically, the way it works is you have to be declared dependent on a state court or placed in a guardianship. So in Iowa, our guardianship laws are such that if you're under 21, between 18 and 21 is where it has to be a voluntary guardianship. Under 18, you can have a child custody order. So actually, that's another common one. You know, with the divorce rate being about 50%, if somebody's going through a divorce, a lot of times their kids might be eligible for special immigrant juvenile status. So the first step is to get a state court order placing them in custody of somebody else, and the state court has to make a finding that the child suffered either abuse, neglect, or abandonment by one of the parents. So you get that approved. Uh, and then right now they're about two and a half years behind on the visas for Mexico and Central America. So your, your kids are kind of sitting here waiting, hanging out. Um, now Immigration and Customs Enforcement, the attorneys for the other side, are going to start opposing continuances for these kids and try to deport them before they can get their green cards because of that um, delay on the visa becoming available. But basically, as long as you get the, the bottom, the first petition filed before the child's 21, they're locked in. So theoretically, you could have somebody waiting from 21 to 23 or 24 and then go apply for their green card. Um, but, but they should have their green card. They're generally, in Iowa, pretty solid cases with a uh, high likelihood of success. So, so, you know, that's, and the immigration judges at this point, um, you know, they are sympathetic to those cases still, at least in Iowa and Nebraska. So the immigration judge can tell the ICE attorney, hey, you know what, this kid's going to get his green card. I'm going to administratively close your case. If the government wants to appeal, they can. Uh, and again, it, it, it kind of goes back to the point of what is our priorities for enforcement. As much as I do agree that Obama had some, I, I think Obama got tricked into the enforcement thing, right? He wanted to say, hey, we're going to enforce all these laws. We're going to be tough. So you guys get together and do bipartisan reform. Instead of saying, you know, it's just wrong to do this enforcement to some of these people, he got tricked. Uh, he really did, because then he had done all this enforcement, and, uh, and then nobody got anything, and he had to do DACA alone, and now DACA's gone. So I, I do think that there was some aspect to that. But the priorities, I mean, Obama did try to focus on, the one good things he did is he did have some priorities, people with OWIs, people with repeated criminal offenses. I mean, there's some people where you, you, you do have to say, well, if we have to make policy and law, you know, maybe this person shouldn't, shouldn't get to stay here. And I, so I think now the priorities are, it's just against everybody. So you're, you're going to miss people. Right now, court dates, I'm getting hearings set for 2020 for their first, uh, for their individual hearing with the judge. So if I get a client bonded out tomorrow, her first hearing with the judge will probably be um, August 2018. Then maybe her individual hearing will be set for 2020, maybe 2021. Then if the person doesn't win that, they can do an appeal to the Board of Immigration Appeals. That might be another two years. So it could be 2022. I mean, it's kind of weird to put these dates on your calendar. I'm just like, gosh, am I going to be practicing law that long? Will I have a different job? What will I be doing at that point? <laughs> you know, it's, and the judges, you know, some of the judges aren't that young either. It's like, oh, Your Honor, are you going to be, uh, going to be around here in 2020? I mean, retirement's starting to look pretty good, isn't it? Um, <laughs> And we've actually had that, you know, judges retire or they, they leave and then their case gets bumped again. I'm, I've literally got cases that started in 2008 that we still don't have an individual hearing for. In a lot of those cases, that's good for the immigrant because the system is so stacked against them. Uh, but a lot of times it's, it's not good. If you have a really strong case, you want to get your case heard and get your status granted. Uh, so basically, to answer your question, once they turn 21, they should be in some either holding pattern or on the way to getting their green card. How do 
they have to prove that with evidence? Like, is it really difficult to prove? That part is not actually difficult to prove. So you can prove that because uh, it's a state court proceeding. So state court judges, um, they have the authority to listen to testimony. That's evidence. So they can listen to testimony. They can get affidavits. Um, if there's police reports or anything like that, certainly you can do that. But I, I would say most of our cases, it's really just based on the child's testimony. And abandonment, I mean, that's, you know, it's, it's relatively common, unfortunately, that, you know, dad runs away at some point. I just want to point out, um, to follow up on one thing you said, Dan, like you're mentioning the priorities in enforcement, mm -hmm. right? And you know those, um, and how we've gone from the Obama administration, which had really stringent priorities and really did try to focus DHS and ICE into criminal removals before non-criminal removals, and now the Trump administration just doesn't care and will remove anyone who's removable. You know that th that bar chart I had up there—that's the Obama administration, right. where the plurality category is none, where the next category is immigration, mm -hmm. where the next category is minor offenses. That's heavy priorities on. Um, criminal offense and violent criminal offenses where they're still removing 30,000 people a year that are actually guilty of that. So, you know, what's that data going to look like in 2017, in 2018, when, you know, the enforcement agencies are really unconstrained by those priorities? You know, I think that's going to be... Um, I think it's left a lot of advocates without a roadmap, too. Like, I know, I, I just came, I moved back to Iowa, which is my home from Michigan, and there was a case there where it was just earlier this year. And in the past, they would always go and say, this person isn't a priority, like, you know, so mm -hmm. grant them relief from deportation. But now you don't have that lever, and they're just, everyone's equally vulnerable. And so it's kind of hard to know how to, how to argue for someone mm -hmm. uh, from an advocate perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, mine's kind of a personal issue. Uh, I don't think it's right. It's public record. Oh, uh, yeah. I, um, I'm an immigrant. I was brought as a child. I was an infant, I should say. I was brought to the United States when I was like three three months old. My mom became a citizen when um, I was 17. Um, but I, I, I don't know if I did or not. I don't know if there was a lot. I keep hearing this thing that if um, your uh, legal guardian becomes a citizen before you turn 18, then you become a citizen as well. I don't know if that's true or not. That's something that I've heard. But um, so yeah, my uh, my resident card expired in 2014, and I mean, I mean, I've been to, I've been to jail a few times. Um, I wasn't even I was even in jail here after it expired, and everything, and. Um, Nothing. The immigration never contacted them or anything. And um, I've been to DOT. I called. And just as an attorney, and because this is being recorded, you can ask me after if you want. But in general, this I think I went to you a year ago. Okay. In uh, general, you, did might, you have an office like yeah, right over you here. You might be a U.S. Yeah. citizen, and those are kind of the. Uh, the but I, I can't even get an ID now, yeah, like an so, actual ID. So you, you kind of might be in that limbo situation where it's like, how do you apply for it? Do you apply for your certificate of citizenship or do you apply for, for a, a passport? Or do uh, I apply for a, a resident card? Right, but basically somebody who's in the legal and uh, physical custody of a parent under 18 with their green card should become a U.S. citizen when one of their parents naturalizes. Okay, um, yeah. As long as it was... Uh, let's see, after 2001, I don't remember the exact date. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I was, I was, see, it was, uh, it was 17, it was like 13 years ago. So, yeah. And again, this does kind of like circle back to, uh, you know, kind of what I'm seeing is, well, why is this so hard for you to get proof of this documentation? Why should your certificate of citizenship, I think those cost like seven or nine hundred dollars yeah. right now. It's outrageous. Oh, yeah. I have to go on a way to like what Omaha or Des Moines to do well, that. Well, now you have to file it in some with some PO box. I mean, it's 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 very cumbersome, uh, yeah. you know, just to get the filing fee together. So we've had cases where somebody's in jail in removal proceedings and we discover they're a citizen, and yeah. that's you know, wow. Well, all right, so. Hi, first speaker, how do I pronounce your name? Uh, Renee Rocho. 
Okay, Renee, I have a quick question because of the graphs you showed. Yeah. Um, it reminds me of when I look at, say, the economic su success of the 1990s. You know, I, um, it's very easy to quickly attribute that to like Bill Clinton, for example, but I know there's a lot more at play when there's an economic boom, you know, than whoever's president of the United States. So my question is, um, to uh, how much can we really attribute whoever, whoever's presidential administration is in power to the actual enforcement of these deportations going on? Or if you need me to rephrase that in a different way, I could ask, um, is, are, are the rise in deportations a result of the presidential administration, our political system, or is it more of a societal drive, a societal force, you know? Um, on uh, smaller levels? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So you really have to connect a couple pieces of information here, right? And so it's at the beginning of the Obama administration that we also see that shift. Not only are we removing people at higher rates, but we're also removing people more within the interior. That was another point I was trying to make. And what's going on there is, again, the shift of efforts from border enforcement into enforcement across the United States, which is a product of that Secure Communities Program. And that Secure Communities Program is piloted in 2008, and then the Obama administration really runs full gas with it. Uh, and you know that, that's what's driving that's what's driving this. That's what's getting those numbers up. The act, you, you saw the decline in border patrol enforcement during that time. The increase in number of removals is not a product of more people entering the United States without authorization. Those are those rates are in um, decline. There's some blips like Jorge is mentioning the you know rush of Central American unaccompanied minors in 2013 or whatever, right? But um, for the but the bulk of individuals entering in the United States those numbers are going down. So we're moving more people because of that program. Um, the Obama administration is very conscious about trying to get those numbers up. There's an actual, there's a stated goal by DHS in their memorandum at some point that they want to hit 400,000, right? And that's, and so now they got to figure out how to hit 400,000. Um, what that program does is it really allows them, again, to shift away from the relatively expensive and inefficient raid and roundup system that was um, popular during the Bush administration, right? Uh, you know, the Obama administration lets them do it. And at the very end, you know, in the, in starting in 2014, the numbers declined a little bit. Um, uh, but, um, you know, when they decline, they still never drop below where they were at the end of the Bush administration. And the thing, so the, the thing that the Obama administration is really couple for is they built that apparatus. They built that huge biometric database. They made all those partnerships. Sure, Johnson County, some you know California, other places eventually opted out of that program. But once that system is built, it's there for DHS to use, right? And that's the and you know that's the um, um, you know real place where um, the Obama administration just uh, is culpable for what happened. Right, and again, they built that apparatus. They hand it over, and it gets handed over to the Trump administration. You know, interestingly, the Trump administration has this great tool that, you know, if they wanted to hit five, six hundred thousand removals a year, they could do it easy. But I'm not sure they're actually going to um, because they're putting too many of their efforts into the old raid and roundup efforts, which are which are inefficient. So that may be scaring people more, and they may be resulting in more traumatic events. But as far as like what are the actual numbers going to be when we see the 2017 numbers, I'm not actually convinced they're going to be higher, right? Because their system of enforcement is more salient but more inefficient. So, I'm sorry, I need to go to a previous commitment, but you can write info at communitybondproject.org with any questions or anything else. Thank you all so much for your Thank attention. You. Yeah. Thanks, Nicole. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. You actually made me think about this question. Uh, secure communities, you basically said that Obama uh, 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 agreed to implement it. Mm -hmm. Well, who came up with secure communities? Is that the, the, the was it in, thought up by a, a think tank? Uh, uh, or was it somebody like the American Legislative Exchange Council? I mean, where yeah. did secure communities come from? Can you tell us? Uh, you know, and 
Dan, I don't know if you have a, a different, um, if you have any, I've, you know, I've, you've sort of seen some of these things play out, if you have a different um, understanding of this. Um, but I actually have a very sinister, um, two, two sinister explanations, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there's this agency in ICE, it's a bureaucratic politics story, called uh, Detention and Removal Operations. And what they do is they're in charge of managing all the detention facilities uh, for, you know, for Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Uh, eventually, they, that subunit disbands and becomes something called ERO, Enforcement and Removal Operations. And now they are the agency which has the ability, which runs the detention facilities, but also has enforcement capabilities, right? And uh, that agency is really instrumental in coming up with different ways to then, now that they have enforcement agencies, different ways to increase the number of people that, that they're apprehending. Because that unit which ran the detention facilities couldn't bring people into the facilities. They could only take the people that either Border Patrol or the other units in ICE brought them. And that agency is one which um, begins to put the biometric data together to start to um, lobby for uh, it, for its it, more increased funding for its expansion, its adoption. Secure communities gets um, you know ends up getting. Oh, at its peak, you know, two, three hundred million dollars dedicated straight for it, right? Um, of course, the private prison industry has um, a huge stake in this. Uh, the Obama administration got a lot of praise when they, the Department of Justice, said that they wouldn't cease housing federal inmates in private prisons. What people forgot is that you know, eighty percent of people who are in federal custody and are in a private prison are not under the jurisdiction of the Department of Justice. They're under the jurisdiction of the Department of Homeland Security, right? They're not there for a federal drug violation. They're there for an immigration violation. And the Department of Homeland Security never promised to not put people in private prisons, right? And, um, you know, so those two groups, the bureaucracy of ICE, the private prisons, Right, were um, sort of the chief internal lobbyists in this sort of in this sort of political history. I don't know, Dan, if you you know have any other experiences with secure communities, kind of saw. Well, you know, just to kind of to to play the other side. I mean, I think to some extent the the idea of secure communities, you know, it sort of makes sense, right? If somebody's in jail or prison for a violent felony or an aggravated felony or something that makes them completely removable. Yeah, we want to figure out who they are and, and send them home. I mean, again, if we're going to talk about compromise, yeah, I would compromise that aggravated felons mm -hmm. in general shouldn't get to stay here, right? Uh, the definition of aggravated felony is arguable, but as a criminal defense attorney as well, most of the time we can keep people from becoming aggravated felons if they have a clean record and they just made a mistake, at least around here in most places. So, I mean, I think to some degree it made sense initially that, hey, if we're looking for the real bad guys, I, I mean, I had guys waiting in prison that had sex charges or drug trafficking charges. Yeah, we don't want them here. I mean, that's, that's, everybody can agree on that. So if the prison has their fingerprints and ICE has fingerprinted them in the past, they should be easily identified and removed or given any chance that they might have for relief at that point. Uh, but then it did get kind of twisted to, oh, anybody who's booked into the jail, we're going to run their prints. So somebody with public intox, my guy that's arrested for being in the park too late, my guy that was arrested for fishing without a license, uh, <laughs> those people, rather than get a citation, they're booked into jail so they can be printed so that they are, are caught by those secure community programs. So I think it's probably, it probably, you know, maybe it was a decent idea by one of these bureaucrats or somebody who said, hey, we've got these fingerprints that we can easily match up that just gets kind of twisted. Uh -huh. And you can see where the... Uh, yes. um, I, I, I like that you're playing the devil's advocate, but I, I really, what you just said, it just, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't agree with me because can you tell me statistically whether there was a problem with violent crime being, you know, being done by by undocumented people? So, I mean, we're we're you're buying into this thing about that we needed it. When I believe that really the problem is, and maybe I I'm, I'm more 
uh, susceptible to sinister uh, conspiracies. Uh -huh. But <laughs> but there there is a lot of money being made by these private detention centers, right. and there is money in the federal budget where re it requires that 34,000 beds be occupied in any in a given day, and so there is an incentive to keep those detention centers filled. And so I. I would say if you don't have data to say that there was a reason to have this secure communities, you shouldn't be saying it, not even as a devil's advocate, because I don't believe that immigrants cause a huge amount of cr violent crime. I think yeah. you know that's playing along the lines of Steve King, who has a database going on his webpage <laughs> about all the crimes you know that are committed across the country. And, and I think that it's a disservice to the immigrant community to say that there was ever a legitimate basis for secure communities. I was disappointed in the Obama administration, but I think he went ahead and did it. I don't know why, but um, that was my comment. Well, I mean, you know that, I mean, I, on your point, I think that's what the Obama administration brought into, right? The Obama administration brought into like, look, we can go into Postville, we can go into Marshalltown, those are incredibly disruptive events. We're getting a whole swath of people. Let's get people who show up in jail, right? right? right. Like that, uh, and um, you know, that seems, better, less disruptive to communities, right? M more normatively acceptable. I mean, the problem was that it's so, it's so much more efficient, right. right? And so they were able to remove more and more and more and more and more people, right? And, um, and then, again, it shifts to anyone who, you know, your guy who's arrested in the park and is just booked and, and then he, right. get, he gets removed, right? And that's not maybe the way that the Obama administration initially envisioned it, but that's the way that DHS implemented it and then the Obama administration sort of ceased to check them on that. Um, I mean, you know, the, the questioner's point is true sociologically, right? Uh, immigrants are less likely to commit crime, right? Um, you know, if the punishment for me to commit a crime was a federal prison sentence, and then, or if I was a person who the punishment was a federal prison sentence and then removal, uh, I would be less likely to, to commit the offense, right? Um, and we saw the numbers, right? 20,000, 30,000 uh, you know, 30, drug violators, you know, 20,000 violent criminal offenders. That's a small fraction of the uh, 350, 400,000 people that are removed in any given year. Um, but, you know, I think you're, I mean, you know, I, I, I in the abstract, Right, it, it was, and we can see what the current system, the return to the rate and roundup system to the Trump administration, I mean, that's just like striking terror in the people, right? right. And you can see why it was preferable to, the, to that in some ways. And that, that, that is a fair point. I mean, yeah, I didn't want to make it sound like, you know, there, there are more immigrants committing cl crimes uh, because as Professor Rocha just said, that's not the case. That's not factually true. So I agree with that. And, you know, one of the, the other disturbing things in terms of the numbers, I just saw a report that they're looking for more private detention facilities and they want to increase the number of people in prison each day to almost 50,000. And, you know, it is bad when people are in, in these detention facilities, they're paying over a dollar a minute to call me. They can't call me for free. They can't call their families. The calls are limited to 15 minutes. The phones, the quality of the conversation is terrible. They're moved to Eldora. Eldora is two hours away. If they have to pay me two hours to drive there, that's $500. $500 to drive back. If I meet with them for an hour, they just spent you know $1,200 on that day. Uh, if I don't have other clients that I can see that can kind of split those costs, so it's it's crazy. Um, and and it is you know I, I think there's definitely something to that. And and again you know. It's a major problem, and, and you're going to see this in the budget. That's why it's important to stay active politically, because these things come up in budgets and places where you're not rallying and you're not marching in the streets for DACA. But it's equally as important, if not more important, to be on the budget stuff. Yeah. Jorge, what's your opinion on her question? <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> I, I, which part of the question? She has multiple ones. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Um, private detention centers? What are, what's my opinion about that? <laughs> um, I feel like we should go to the next question because I saw that her hand is up and the hand is up there. Let's talk about it in class. <laughs> Oh. About DACA. oh, yeah, they need the microphone. Uh, my question is about DACA. What is the situation after October 5th? 
Well, people who have DACA, uh, if their work card expired between now and January, they were able to renew it. Uh, so people are gonna have their DACA, and, and once their DACA runs out, they're gonna have a decision. Do they keep working with their valid social security number, or do they stop, or what do they do? And again, I, I'm not optimistic about a legislative fix at this point. I mean, the, I, I just don't see it happening. Somebody's gonna want the wall, <laughs> or some incredibly punitive things in a bill in exchange to extend DACA, or DACA will be something completely different. So um, they're gonna have a decision. Will ICE come and look for those people and put them in removal proceedings? I think that's uh, a hard, I, I don't know. Um, I still think in my practice, I pretty much do generally see them taking the easy, mm -hmm. the easy path. I mean, they like to shoot fish in a barrel. So it's somebody in the jail, somebody on supervision. Another thing that they're making a bunch of money off is these ankle bracelets. So I don't know who came up with these GPS monitoring devices, but they're the worst thing in the world. They're on people's legs, they burn them, they cause pain, they have to charge them for hours a day. And I'm sure the government is paying outrageous amounts of money to these companies to make these GPS monitors. And you're telling me my iPhone, <laughs> you know, you can get an old iPhone and it tells you where you're at and who's moving around and who's doing what. And if we know anything, you don't probably need a GPS monitor, just give somebody an iPhone. They'll keep that, they'll keep it everywhere they go, right? <laughs> they're, they're not gonna. So I don't know what's gonna happen with DACA. I'm, I'm not optimistic, frankly. Um, you know, I think one thing um, that we, it's, it's difficult to keep sight of is how insane some of the Republican proposals are that they're asking for in exchange of this. So for example, uh, the legislation in the House, which is coupled with the border wall legislation, has a provision to require a two-year mandatory minimum prison sentence for individuals who uh, violate a prior removal order. So someone is deported, they re-enter the United States, they're re-apprehended. That is now a two-year federal mandatory minimum prison sentence. Okay. The number of people that would have caught last year is 190,000. The entire size of the federal penal system is like 200,000 people, right? So like, we, you're gonna like double the size of the federal prison population and have half of them be there on, on immigrant, like it's just, it's just like not feasible to like do it, right? And so you can't, you like can't give, you can't give them that because like you actually can't implement it. And so these are the positions that they're working up against, you know, funding the border wall, doing these, and that's not even the most like salient thing. That's like not the border wall. That's like a minor part of that legislation, right? And so I think it's really difficult to like lose sight of like how just, impossible it is to compromise with that set of proposals, right? We saw, you know, the Trump administration's more recent things they wanted in exchange for DACA. Let's cut the number of legal immigrants, right? The sort of stuff that came out from Stephen Miller. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you, what you think I'll have. <laughs> now you want to hear. <laughs> um, I'm also very, very pessimistic about the entire outlook for DACA. I mean, I hate saying this. I know it, it feels even a bit gross saying it just because I know that at least Percy, for me, I'm not affected by it, but I know a lot of friends who are, who are. And I mean, we just have to admit when it, it it's, I think I've said this even in my class, like it's so embarrassing. I mean, on, I guess on the, the whole idea of power, at least, it's kind of embarrassing that the Republicans have the House and the Senate of the presidency and they can't pass a major le legislation. I mean, I personally don't at all, um, agree with most of their policies, but it's still very embarrassing that they themselves can't compromise. So imagine trying to reach down the aisle to the Democrats and ask them for assistance. Um, it's, it's sort of a, it's sad that it's a taboo now to ask for assistance from, from your colleagues. I mean, if they can't get their stuff together between each other, imagine trying to pass DACA or, or the DREAM Act or any type of immigration reform with with Democrats in this hot environment. I mean, he I almost, I almost said poor Trump. I was like, don't call him poor Trump. <laughs> but he got so much beef just for talking to, you know, Pelosi and Schumer and who knows what else just to just to draft something for for DACA or for the Dream Act or any type of immigration reform. Imagine if you then he goes back to his administration or the caucus or the caucus in, in the Senate and the House. I'm like, 
I'm, I'm just, I'm very, very pessimistic. I, the only thing I can do is like light a candle and hope for the best. That's what I, that's the only hope I have. I mean, the one positive thing I'll say uh, is I do agree with you, Dan. I don't think like they're going to go and target the DACA roles, right? Just my understanding of, of DHS and ISIS bureaucracy, like that's, they don't want that negative publicity. That's not easy for them, right? Because these people aren't in centralized locations, right. right? And so what they do is they do stuff like secure communities. They do stuff like Postville, right? And so, you know, if your DACA eligibility expires and you end up in a county jail that cooperates with secure communities, you're not protected. But I don't, you know, I, that's different than like fearing that they're going to go down the rolls and go to everyone's house and you know pick people up. So, yeah, um, I wonder what uh, the panelists uh, think about um, the influence of uh, racism on a lot of what is going on. Um, see, approximately 120 years ago. There was a big event in, you know, uh, history of Western nations, 1898, U.S. and uh, Spain, the Spanish-American War, Spain lost, so they ceded to the United States, Cuba, Philippines, Guam, Puerto Rico. Now, today we all know the situation in Puerto Rico. Well, they are not free, like a modern state member of the United Nations or 51st state of the United States. So they are in a place in between. It's a big welfare state. Now, every time they vote, they say they want to be free, we don't let them. Or we keep telling them, well, you are natural born citizens of the United States. But what does that say? They can't participate in anything in Congress. So I'm just wondering, because US foreign policy keeps going over there, messing with different governments in Central America and Latin America and won't let them have any democracy. They overthrow them and all that kind of stuff. And by the way, I have heard people, I mean, here in Iowa State, they're just having a conversation. Actually, they are ignorant. When they heard DACA, capital D-A-C-A, -A, they said, well, we don't need to deal with those people because guess what? They are DACA, D-A-R-K-E-R. -E I mean, what kind of stupid thing is that? But Something is wrong in the core, at the core, okay, at the bottom of all this. I think it's racism, but maybe that's just me. So what do you think? Thank you. Yeah. Jorge, um, yeah. I, uh, hopefully I'm trying to understand your question you're asking. You're, you're asking whether racism is... I think there's a lot of racism mm -hmm. the whole thing. Racism of the... Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, racism is definitely one of many factors. Um, I also like to pay attention to the fact of, um, you know, wonderful corporations here in the United States who like to come into these particular countries because they see it as a place to not only grow financially, but also places where they don't have to worry about, like, taxes. They don't have to worry about... Um, any labor laws, they don't have to worry. There's just, there's just a lot of, at least in trying to put corporations here in the United States, there are a lot of, I guess you can say, laws where they cannot, I guess, can, where they cannot make as much profit compared to trying to go to somewhere like Guatemala, where I think there's always some type of protest somewhere out in the highlands or the mountains where the communities, but specifically indigenous communities, are always fighting against a new corporation trying to wipe them out or remove them in order to create the next new plant. I mean, I think the most recent one I read was about a Canadian plant and that was not only moving Guatemala but also Honduras and just trying to create a hostile environment within the community and of course removing them, tainting their waters, a whole host of issues. Um, like I said, racism has, it will forever play a role in all of these foreign, foreign policies and the implement, implementation of these foreign policies, whether they deny it or not. And of course it comes out of US interests, just like these corporations want to make profit, the country also wants to make profit out of all these corporations too. And as I sort of mentioned so many times in my class, 
no corporation can be ethical. So when it comes to the human life affected by it, even if these workers come into these, like for example, if these, when, when these companies come into places like Guatemala, when the workers come in there, they get paid almost nothing. I can even talk about the experience of my sister. I have a sister in Guatemala who was actually affected by uh, specifically the Korean corporations who were coming into Guatemala. It was very interesting when she had mentioned about how there's a large Korean population in Guatemala. I'm like, really, why are they there? Because they have moved there to create their own businesses and create their own profits there too. And then she had to work under their rules and she had to put up with a whole lot of silly regulations that she did not deserve to be in but she had to feed her kids. She's a widow. Her husband died, I forget how many years ago now, but she has four kids, one of whom is married now, but she has some kids that she has to send to school to. My mother helps, I try to help how much as I can too, but in her case, she would like to have a better life, but she can't. She has to deal with, in her case, the, the Korean corporates who are essentially taking advantage of her labor. And I'm using that as an example, just because that's my sister. But it's not a very, it's not an uncommon story. It's like, again, it's not, I don't always want to make it seem as, as a, uh, the United States participates in these events. It's always these sort of like super world powers, such as, you know, wonderful France, Great Britain, any sort of technology, um, every country that has some kind of technology, technolo technological advance, advancements in our country like to come to these spaces where they feel that they can take advantage of people who are not going to sue them, don't have the knowledge how to sue, don't have the rights to sue. Um, I can go on and on because eventually with racism and these talks of corporations, there are other intersections involved. Yeah, uh, thank you, if, if I may follow. You see, I understand what you're saying, but people need to understand that American slavery system, we talk about transatlantic slavery, were the first people to be enslaved in the United States by the, the original you know, system were not black Africans. They were Irish, they were white, and they were called indentured servants. Mm -hmm. Well, they didn't want to participate in any of that. They didn't want to cooperate because they look at themselves and they had the same skin color as the master, so everything fell apart, okay? Then they had to go somewhere else. And then they took into consideration climate, the weather, the whole system, and some things they, they got from Magellan and Vasco da Gama and all that kind of stuff. Then they decided, oh, 80 degree, 90 degree temperature, that kind of stuff, where well, you need people who can stand under that and do whatever is necessary. Mm -hmm. So the first people to rebel were actually white. And it was because of skin color thing, that was a very critical part of the whole journey to go to West Africa and get all those people, okay? Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is, underneath all this stuff, we say immigration and all that kind of stuff, fine. But, but look at, look at uh, Puerto Rico. Is that an immigration problem? No. Well, why can't they be free? I mean, really free. Be a state independent or be the 51st state of the United States. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sí. Bueno, yo solamente quiero, com uh, I want to just to comment that sometimes um, when I hear these conversations, I think like, um, and also it's going to be related to the last comment that I hear, that first, uh, talking about locally, I think that this situation about immigration is like a good and bad. It's not Republicans and Democrats. Because as a Latinos, I can tell you like, uh, we are kind of like just one piece of the game. And both parties use us. Actually, the, the last immigration reform was for the Republicans. Obama, in the first like, uh, month, he had the opportunity to do something. And he, didn't, he did nothing. In his administration, is more than 5,000 Latino kids in foster homes, which Hillary Clinton say. I mean, she did nothing as well. So, in you, this national like a situation, you can come locally. Just last year, locally, we were so close to have like a one anti-immigration law. Why? Because almost 10 Democratic like a congressman, but together with the Republican Party. So I think 
when we talk about migration, we need to understand that it's not like the goods and the bads. The system is against us. And the system is both parties right now. Could be so like a Congress, like a woman or man in our side. But the system, the structure, is against the, the, the immigration. Just to say that. So I think we have to be uh, more clear because otherwise when I, I come to these forums, it's like, oh, the Republicans, they are bad. The Democratic Party is good. No, that is not true. And Iowa is English only. Thank you to the Democratic Party. And I can go on and on and on. So both parties use us like a, as a political piece in the, in the chess. Internationally, both parties, they don't do nothing. You can go to Walmart, to Mexico, right now. They had thousands of kids, like at eight to 11 years old, working by free. You don't want immigrants in this country? It's to Walmart here in, in this country. And nobody talks about that. So this is some conversation like we can do something in this country in order to stop the immigration in our countries. And nobody talk about all the Coca-Cola, Nestle. Nestle right now, I mean, Chiapas, which is one of the, has one of the biggest jungles in the world, has a crisis of water. Why? Because Nestle and Coca-Cola, they are using, I mean, overusing the natural resources. Don't you want these people in this country? Stop the companies here. So I think it, we need to start to, um, to see what is happening. Both parties, when you read about the crisis in Puerto Rico, was Clinton. So putting all these like a mess up in the economics was the Democratic Party. In America, they say in Mexico, it's one of the most anti-democratic systems in the world. Some states is more than almost 90 years, just in case you don't know. Some states in Mexico, they have 90 years with the same party, with the same family. How you hear about that? No, because they are working with the American system. So we need to, to see, I think, like a more like a um, integral view about what is immigration. And the numbers, Obama is the chief in deportation. This is the truth. The numbers are cold, but no president in America deport more people than, than Obama. Yeah. And so, you know, I think that, you know, um, you know, the question is correct. The Democratic Party has this incredibly complicated history with immigration enforcement. And, you know, it's really talk about Democratic Party, it's just talk about the Obama administration, because in some ways it doesn't make sense to go back um, and look at what enforcement patterns were like back, you know, during during the '90s or during the previous Democratic administrations, right? Because the regime's just uh, so different now. Four hundred thousand people annually, right? That's so much more than the Bush administration was doing. Um, but you know, DACA and DAPA, right? And so it's just you know, the elimination of DACA is like, you know, that was a temporary. It's temporary, right? Right. Right, and you know, I, you know, so sort of Dan suggested earlier that the initial increase in enforcement was, was, a political calculation, a a miscalculation that if he enforced enough, he could, buy get Republican support for comprehensive immigration support. They had no intention of ever actually cooperating with him, right? And so he just built this apparatus, uh, of of enforcement that wasn't going to ever yield the legislative. Um, a victory that he that he wanted, but you know it's but, you know I think but I think I agree with you, Dan. I think that's part of the story, right? And so you know I think the Republican Party, you know, it's the modern Republican Party. You know, the Bush administration tried for comprehensive immigration reform. McCain Kennedy was a sincere effort. You know, it, it failed, but it was a, it was a sincere effort and had the endorsement of the Bush administration. The mo the post Bush Republican Party does not have a complicated relationship with immigration enforcement. It has a universally negative relationship. And the Democratic Party is complicated, right? And so, like, you know, complicated, you know, they're not just, um, you know, advocates for immigrants. Um, but they're not trying to sanction them uniformly and harshly, like all contemporary Republican proposals really do, right? So. 
the problem is over there, and don't fix it. Yeah. Meanwhile, we have hospitals where the kids they were like being like a, in the slight conditions, mm -hmm. or much of the time. Mm -hmm. And we can review the data right now, and, and every single week, we have like a case where like a, everybody is being detained. Mm -hmm. in, in, with no background, like a background. Mm -hmm. So just to say like a democratic party is kind of like a, it's okay, it's worse because the problem is growing and they are using us all the time. When it's election, you are going to see the party in our communities. When it's no election time, they disappear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. to sort of add to that, because you're bringing up a really important issue that I think it's important to address to at least voters who identify as, as Latina, Latino, Latinx communities. Because one of the things that the Democratic Party is really trying to fight hard with is trying to boost those numbers of Latin, Latinx peoples to go out and vote. Because out of all the groups, Latinx peoples are at the bottom in terms of turnout. And you know, for, for many of the Democratic machine, they're wondering why don't they come out and vote for, for the Democratic Party? I mean, there are many, many factors to why they don't come out in numbers for Democratic Party. And I think they just don't have, at least based on the research that I do with Guatemalans and Central Americans, I think the Democratic Party has horrible outreach in trying to connect to them in terms of not all, because of course they always want to say immigration, immigration, immigration as a main policy. Yes, immigration affects Latinx peoples. It affects essentially all groups. And, Rather, it's intimately or abstractly or any other shape or form. But of course, that things people always care about, like, where am I going to get my money? I need, I need to know about the economy. I need to know about health care. I need to know what's the future of my kids. I need to know what's going to protect my family, and protect my values. And, and, many, and then, but the Democratic Party is always aggressively saying, like, no, immigration, immigration, immigration all the time. And that becomes incredibly um, unsuccessful. And another part that I always feel that I always want to pay attention to in terms of low voter turnout, a lot of, a, a lot of um, what do you call it, sorry, um, a lot of um, um, immigrants who do identify as Latinx peoples, Many of them come from horrible, horrible regimes. They're experiencing a lot of trauma from all the atrocities that experienced back in their countries. Like I know a lot of family members, they are US citizens. Their children are US citizens. But none of them, they're in California, so in many ways it doesn't matter whether they vote or not. But they don't vote because they don't trust the government. Why don't they trust the government? Because they did not trust the Guatemalan government. The same goes with a lot of Central American immigrants and their children. They strong, they coming from that intense political mayhem that, that either their parents experience or they experience in it. They, they just refuse to participate and they have issues with what they call the United States. I can go on and on and on, but there's, there's so many factors to what plays into low voter turnout. And like you said, it's quite embarrassing that they only want them when they need them, and it's kind of disgusting. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all for coming. We're running out of time, so Renee, you want to wrap up quickly? Okay. And yep. Um, so again, uh, I want to uh, be sure to thank the Iowa City Public Library, and as well as the Public Policy Center for co-sponsoring this event. Um, I want to uh, uh, mention uh, one more time that the Public Policy Center is doing another Wonk Wednesday on November 15th with Pete Damiano uh, on the Affordable Care Act, repeal, replace, or repair. And so, um, you know, I hope that you'll uh, consider coming to that as well. And, you know, I want to, you know, uh, thank uh, Jorge and Dan for coming here and offering us those perspectives. You know, I think that that was just absolutely, you know, um, one, one of the more enriching dialogues on this I've had in a long time. And thanks to you guys for coming in with those questions. So, thank you.